Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. Firstly, and before we get on to this week's episode, honourable mention has to go to Ray O'Dwyer from Lismore in County Waterford, who has caught the first salmon of the season that we know of on the fly on the Blackwater on the opening day on February the 1st. He was fishing Carysville Fishery near Fermoy, with the river running slightly below normal level for the time of year when he hooked the fish just after noon. It took a tube fly and was fresh in from the sea with sea lice still attached and it weighed six and a quarter pounds. So congrats, Ray. Well done on that first fish of the season. Congrats there. It's great to see Tom actually, isn't it? The fish. Um, yeah, it is great. Isn't it? Fish really is. Like yeah. But like, as we've been touching on here, every year, well, not every year, but there is sort of, um, it's later every year. Yeah. You know? And yeah, I think the best February. way to put it, I mean, we're into February now. You see that, you know, and I think it's been a while since the Blackwater would have had the first fish. Yeah, I wonder actually. Yeah, I must check that out. When was the mm. last time for it? Like, it's, um, yeah. ah, look, it gives us anchors <laughs> hope, isn't it, with the opening of the <laughs> season? Does. Like, you know, <laughs> could be in with a chance. Like, um, but look, we'll, we'll move on to this week's episode. And I suppose, look, the start of the season in Carb is only around the corner. Um, it comes next week, February the 15th. So we thought we'd catch <laughs> up with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll contain myself. <laughs> contain yourself there. <laughs> so we thought we'd catch up with Mike Keady, the Carob expert in Irish international angler, to get his insights in getting the most out of spring fishing on the lock, with a focus on duck fly hatch, which is when I suppose the first real numbers of fish are being caught on the fly. Tom, before we hear from Mike, um, so I take it you're looking forward to, <laughs> to yeah, February yeah, 15th. Yeah, I, I, I might have just jumped the gun there <laughs> on a bit, all right. Uh, yeah, I can't wait. Really can't wait. Always look forward to it every year. And so sure, why wouldn't you? You know what I mean? Like, you can get out fishing and you can go out. Um, thing is about it, though, and, and Mike touches on it there, you might go out, but, like, it's just the fact of getting out. You know, it's 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 not, you know, the fishing. The fishing might be all right, but it could be, you know, we're, we're at the mercy, as we always are, but particularly so in February, uh, to the conditions. And if we get drafts bad conditions, I mean, we could have the beast from the east or whatever. It's not going to be, as a fellow used to say around here, it's not going to be a bowl of cherries. So <laughs> you get out, you have your day out, and you look forward to it. But like, I think what's important here, because when we were discussing it with Mike, we talked, we went a bit further and to the duck fly, which, you know, once the season open, isn't too far down the line. And mm. what we're looking forward to is when fish start moving. And I mentioned it to you in it, and you can re you grasp that straight away as well because mm. it's like when you go down to the river, and mm. you start to see to to see fish moving, it it that's that's what's telling you now. Yeah. now I, I always love, like, even whether it's the black water, say I'd be down the black water this time of year um, or onto the shore kind of after Paddy's Day is, yeah, I always find those first few because kind of dour kind of weeks can be like, you know, it's, but then like, but then, like I said, the weather can change. Like it can, you can get a few really mild days. And and Mike and yourself talk about incredible um, fishing you had, didn't you? Um, a couple of years ago around the duck fly, like where it just seemed to come to oh, life. Yeah. Like. yeah, you really can. I mean, like you got to remember. I mean, we're talking when we go on to the duck fly. It's still early in the season. You you know, it's still you know mid March, and you know I think and I mentioned there that when the beast from the east came from a couple of years ago, it's about the mm -hmm. same time. So, you know, you just don't know what you're going to get. But in if you get right conditions, and Mike touches on this as well, mm -hmm. um, if you get in any way mild weather, then suddenly everything can change. Everything mm -hmm. can change. That's the whole thing. The fish start moving. And once you see that, it gets you going. And, and, but it is the kind of advantage, though, if you're living nearby, isn't it, that if you see, you look out the window and you see the conditions are settled, you know, you do have a chance to get out for a few hours. Because, in fairness, the period, the window is still quite short, isn't it, in terms of because of the... short. We're touching it there. We said probably two, two and a half weeks at a stretch, maybe three, depending on what generally it's. It's a two-week window, uh, maybe maybe a small bit more. So, yeah. So, you know, like I, I know from anglers used to visit, that would visit from... The UK, you know, if they they come over for a week, let's say take them one of the weeks of the duck fly, there's a good chance that of that, let's say six days fishing, they might only get three or four days. Yeah, but yeah. you know, that happens. I mean, like, funny when you said that. I remember when we went to Durness. Funny enough, Mike was with us when we went to Durness in Scotland, and I've been there twice and got a whole week's fishing both 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 trips, and I was chatting to a couple of guys up there who fishing every year for nearly 20 odd years and they said as a rule you generally lose one or two days fishing up there with the with the 
the gales coming in off the off the North Atlantic. You just have to expect it, kind of like you just expect it. So you know, it's very possible if you're out in wild water. But that's why, and you touched that there, yeah. It is an advantage living beside it, you know. But like it's you know, and we say once you're out in the country, it's kind of look. I mean, you you've told me of some evening rises on the river beside you, and you know, like I I I want to be very lucky to experience something like that because I'm so far away from it, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's just on the road from you. It, but it's that kind of thing is you just have to you put in the errors you know if you're lucky enough that you can put in the errors like that and you you know you hit it enough times eventually yeah. you know mm. <laughs> a stopped clock is is right twice a day yeah as they you say. know if you're there some of the time yeah tell yeah, me no, this actually do you um when you go out in the 15 do you are you out with the fly rod yeah uh last couple of years last couple of years i've done a bit of trolling with the bricking i suppose it's just the traditionalist in me just to do a bit um as a rule, I'd nearly always have done the the fly rod, but um, and I think this year I'm going to do a bit more because I want to I want to hone in a bit more. And funny, we discussed this as well with Mike. I, I want to hone in more on my lure fishing, my minky, humongouses, uh, your bully buggers, whatever. I want to try that out more and perfect it because I think there's an art. Now, this is the thing: people say, "Oh, sure, that's only pulling lures. There's nothing to it." Interestingly. People also say that about trolling the bricking, and it's it's not the same for trolling the bricking. There's an art. There's it's like everything. There's a right way of doing things, and there's the haphazard slapdash way of doing things. Well, on the lure fishing, um, two words: Kate McDonald. <laughs> yep, exactly. You know, exactly. Like a master of it, like, and look what an he's a master of it. Yeah. You know, so, but actually, I did want to ask you about the brickings. Um, what I'm fascinated by because you've a wealth of knowledge on this in terms of the kind of historic stuff. Mm. Was that a traditional kind of time of year that for culturally that the lads that season it open and they'd be out trolling for the brick Yeah, the they it would, always still done? do. Still do. It's very much part of the Carrop scene. And brick is basically, they use minnows. Uh, although brick probably translates as small trout. Yeah. So that's it. That's interesting for the dog, you know, but um, they, and it might have been a long, long time ago that it would have been small trout that was used. Right? Yeah. But definitely for the last hundred or so years it has been uh, minnows that have been used and they're trapped and you keep them and then you mount them but you kill them they're, you don't mount them live anyway de- uh, live baiting is illegal but you don't and you put them on a mount hmm. and you troll them and yeah there's been a long tradition of it here and the professional fishery that ran on the lake here uh, was generally it was guys fishing with um, with Brickin. And was the early time of the year was kind of the year for catching to export to make money I want it was. Now, the, the guys would have fished right throughout the year where they could, but the early time of the year was the peak time of the year. Fish, yeah. you know, fish are trying to put on condition. Coming yeah. into the, you know, spring, there's more food starting to come around. They're, they, After spawning, they want to build up condition again, so they're more eager to feed and everything. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it brings into the whole argument, like a sea trout, you know, could feed until July. Um, and then, you know, come into... A lake with very little food and wait there till spawning time, just eating haphazardly. Mm. But it puts its condition on in that early part of the spring. Now, a brown trout is a sea trout is a brown trout. We won't get into that, but you know, if you take the lake as such, the same as well. If you imagine the lake to be the sea, they're putting all their condition on up until the summer, so that they're going to be in fine fettle for the coming winter. So, if that's the way they're going to be feeding more, then it's, it follows through that if you're going to fish for them. That's when it's going to be the most opportunity to have big big bags, and they wanted big bags. I think I mentioned last year. I don't know whether it was Mike's one or not, but you know, between nineteen, oh, I, I check it, but nine, in a ten-year period up to the First World War, it was fifty tons of trout sold out of Uthard. You know, legitimately, you know, fish house records put in the train in Uthard and shipped to Billingsgate, and in one month alone, in February, nineteen eleven which was a record year, a record month. There was a, over a ton of trout in that month alone. And the fishermen were earning, or I think it was five pounds a week. And I put in one of those calculators for present day. And that worked out at over 500 sterling a week. You could understand why they were going. <laughs> yeah, trouble. you could. You yeah, know. you could big time. I remember hearing a fellow once, somebody asked him why he didn't go to England. Um, then I lived on the shore of the lake and he just pointed out to the lake, answered your man, he says, that's my England. That's kept me going. Yeah, that's why you didn't yeah. have to emigrate yeah. back. Um, Usher, look, we'll hear from Mike Eady now. 
it's, it's really interesting because, and I learned a lot from it because you, re- you guys really go into um, detail and kind of the duck fly and um, how it works, how to make the most of it. So, I, you know, it's well worth um, having a listen to. I think people get a lot out of this episode. And I first asked Mike if he had done any fishing since the end of last season. Probably the end of the sea. Well, actually, October, because it would have been done a few days up in Lachlan and Constown. So would have wrapped it up at that there then in early October. So I wouldn't have been fishing at all since actually. You didn't even bother you didn't even bother doing a spot of rainbow fishing around at the mic, no? No, no, I didn't. I kind of got sidetracked onto other things and I'd lift the boats and clean them out. And then you're doing a bit of shooting and then the time has gone by and then the next thing you're back to the fishing again. So what about fly time? Are you doing any fly time? I haven't done a bit this year. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing I, I i said to tom one day i says my problem isn't time flies my, at the minute my problem is actually sorting out me flies i think more so than anything there's flies everywhere so that's a pro i thought i would have started that by now but i haven't but i will now in the next i'd say once the fishing starts you're more into the zone of it and then you kind of get more i i find actually i tie more flies when the fishing is on and you know, Ross, rather than during the winter, I used to one time, but I just kind of completely just kind of got out of that. So I'm kind of more interested now if there was a competition coming up or there was something coming up that you'd actually tie a few flies maybe the week or so before you'd be out in the lake and you'd know what's going on or and you'd tie a few flies then more so than I'd rather sit down and tie a dozen flies then rather than tie stuff during the winter. But do you get antsy during the winter, kind of, oh, I can't wait for, you know, the season to kick off again? Or are you sometimes, are you one of the ones that is just glad it's nice to kind of come back to it clean after a bit of a break? Like, mm, No, I'd kind of be busy enough. So, like, so I'd be doing a good bit of shooting and that. So then I'd, I think once it kind of, once you come to the tours around the middle of January, third week of January, then you start just kind of saying to yourself, yeah, I'm really looking forward now. You'd be kind of buzzing now at the minute to be really kind of gearing up to, to just waiting to start you know yeah it's, it's funny you should say that because there is something nice about tying a fly with the, the with sort of the the apprehension or the knowledge that you're going to be using it like next week yeah you know yeah. what i mean or, or that or the weekend coming up it's kind of hard to motivate yourself you know the middle of november when it's a couple of months yeah away. i find in the winter time you know you'd have stuff or like you'd have certain flies to be working for you kind of all the time or you'd have certain patterns and I suppose you'd have those kind of topped up during the year anyway. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, I think then you may be leading into, we'd say, probably duck fly, you know what I mean? So you'll be kind of tying a few flies, maybe start to March. You know, you'll be kind of, you'll do a couple of weeks on the lake first, probably trolling or a bit of bricking fishing or maybe a bit of fly fishing, whatever. But, you know, you once, once it comes early March, then you're kind of saying, right, Paddy's day on, you know, it's going to be a bit of fly around, you know, you're kind of more interested then, then you're, you know, once, once that then, you know, once it starts into April, you're kind of saying the olives will be starting now, kind of mid April or so, you know what I mean? And you're kind of more into that. And then, you know, and then you have the mayfly kicking in, but you know, you'd always have kind of a few core patterns, but you'd be always tiny few things as well, you know? But tell me this, are those kind of first few weeks, I'm always fascinated with those kind of shadow boxing in a way that was kind of from the 15th up until kind of March in the sense of you're going out, you're casting a butt you're doing a bit of trolling but you're not really you're not really expecting that and you're just kind of warming up nearly like yeah it's more nice to get out i think you know you see a lot of lads now 15th you'll see loads of lads out and three quarters of those lads you probably won't see them begin till the may flight you know what I mean? so you know what i mean so like it's you know you'd have a core of lads that'll be fishing kind of all the time or nearly every weekend or you know all the time but like yeah you'll have a lot of lads that'll get out the first day and you know, they might go again then till, you know, maybe there's a bit of fly around or, you know what I mean, or into the mayfly, you know. T- Tom, when do you start guiding? Like, do you get clients this this early, like in February? Uh, yeah, you get a couple of regulars, guys who fish normally, but um, uh, it's, it's you know, there wouldn't be a lot of people around. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to get people to come down because you really don't know what's, what's going to be served up to you. I mean, we've discussed this before with Mike. I mean, we might plan to do a, a day's fly fishing, you know, in February. And you just look and you go, it's, it's not really the day to do it, you know. And that's like, and we, we touched on it there. Like, you know, always have the backup of doing a bit of trolling. And it's just a fact of getting out. To, to bring people down, well, you know this, Mike. 
you don't know what you're going to get. I mean, like, if you arrived down here for some of the days we've been out in February, you wouldn't really want to go out, would you? No, you wouldn't really want to go out. And, like, it's grand. It's nice when you're near and you're right beside the lake. And it's it's very easy to kind of say, right, I'll go today or I won't go today. You know what I mean? Whereas if someone has to travel a few hours, well, you can't really ask them to make that kind of commitment. You know what I mean? Look, once... Like duck fly time, you know there's you know there's hatches going on, you know there's a bit of fly, you're going to get a bit of shelter somewhere in a corner, even if it's not great weather, lads will probably accept that. But you know, early season is just kind of it's you can get any kind of weather, you know. It really is actually just that you said it there. Uh, we've touched on it twice now already, but really, uh, if you ask me, I mean, it's it's great that it's open this early and everything. I love and I love being able to get out and I've had some great fly fishing, but. Really, what we're looking at to, to get into it in earnest, Mike, it's probably the duck fly, isn't it? Oh, yeah, duck fly kicks it off, really, you know. Yeah. That comes Paddy's day on, really, you could say. Do you know what I mean? Now, it can, look, it can be so varied, but mm, normally yeah. around, and I went out, like, well, the year before last now, um, I went out on the 19th. It was an afternoon, I think it was a Friday afternoon. I was finished early and I went out, just went out and spec. First few holes I done, there was duck fly hatching, there was a couple of fish moving. I think I had three fish in about two hours. And I said, Brilliant. I said, went out on the Sunday. Then it wasn't a great day, but there was plenty, plenty of fly up um with a friend of ours there, Barry Malai from Kong. And we had a brilliant day's fishing. We had like we had serious fishing now. We had probably about 10 fish to the boat, I'd say, and lost a few more. And it was just, and it was only just starting, like you were in little corners, basically, where there was a bit of flight and just letting the breeze take you out for 10 or 15 yards and a few corners where there was actually fish active. You went out any further, it was useless, but you know, that can be that way at the start of it. And I just said to Barry, I said, this is going to be brilliant in a few days' time. I said, it's going to be absolutely. I said, a bit of bit of wind to come in the next couple of days, I think. It blew solid for the next yeah. 10 days. And I mean, it was, I actually was talking to a neighbour of mine up the road here. And he said to me, did you ever see the weather like this? He said, I'm up and talking about the weather. <laughs> but, um, and it absolutely destroyed it. Like the duck fly was practically over by the time the weather settled down again like it was just it shows you, you then, isn't it Tom as well that the importance of being able to kind of just react like to be there you know you've the conditions are right get out because you don't know what it's going to be like the next day or two like. yeah yeah because we had, actually had it a all good few years ago um, the duck flight was just about starting duck ride 50 competition was on do you remember that Tom and then we got terrible weather and mm. just at the very end of the duck fly the weather just settled down we got a real pet day one Saturday and uh, Tom came down as far as me and we went out. I was actually waiting for Tom and I said, Scott, I'll, go, I'll just go out pothing around the bay. And uh, I had two fish caught by the time Tom arrived. Yeah. yeah. We had, we had, um, we had uh, a brilliant day's fish. And then we actually, mm. at one stage, we were actually out, out in, in one area at one stage. And uh, I got, I was, I said, oh, we'll move out of here. There's not much happening. And the next thing I, I got into a tangle. I said, ah, you fish on there for a few minutes. I'll just get this sorted. Just so I was getting the tangled sword. Uh, by the way, that, can I just add, that wasn't a question. That was more of an order, I think. Remember, right <laughs> oh, here. yeah, we weren't going anywhere. I was able to fish. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the next thing, Tom's been to today's fish, and we watched him going around the boat, and we eventually got him in, and he was just tipping over a pound. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, it was class. It was fantastic. It really was. And it was like, that was... We had, a, we had a brilliant day. We were in double figures that day on fish, and like the, the duck fly was practically over, but... It's just getting it right is the key thing with the duck fly. Weather is weather is huge in it. It's absolutely huge. So what are those conditions that you're ideally looking for? You're ideally looking for mild west to southwest weather conditions. Um and ideally coming into the evening time, afternoon, even for the wind to drop drop off completely. And when you say mild mild, Mike, do you mean mild for March? Like what are you mild for March, yeah, kind of like We'll say 10 degrees, do you know what I mean? 10 degrees plus. Just about double figures. Yeah, suppose, just about yeah. double figures, really, you know. So is that the is that the key? Uh in the sense like when you see the temperature coming into the double figures, that's when you coming into the double figures helps for hatches, but like I think they're going, you know, duck fly are resilient enough, they're gonna hatch anyway. Um 
But I think the key thing is really the wind, well, strength, but more so direction as well. And predominantly, like with duck fly, it's not like the bigger buzzer in the summertime. It's specific to areas. So basically, they're called duck holes. But yeah, I was going you know, to say that. You mentioned holes earlier on. I was yeah, deep to... area, deep, deep weedy areas of water. Like they just have that name. But um, because they're not big, Mike. They're not. Some of them are like some duck holes can be very, you know, can be. 10 yards square like do you know yeah. what I mean they're, you know some of them aren't big areas you're not talking about big areas you know you're talking about a lot of them are in around shallows you know what I mean and where you have where you have just kind of a, a deep hole in around shallows at times you know what I mean a lot that's why the duck fly is more more specific local knowledge is vital in it mm. yeah, you know it is, you might know in, in an area you might know 30 duck holes yeah. and on any given day Maybe only five of those are producing fish. Mm. It's very interesting because uh, it's good because like Mike fishes, well, not the complete lower part of the lake, but Mike is closer down to Birch Hall, Mike Cullen. Mm -hmm. And I fish tours. And it's like basically in a lot of respects, it's the same lake, but it's like two different lakes. But it's really good when we fish together, when I fish down with him, because I would know, like Mike said there, there might be 30 duck holes he'd know in his area. I would know maybe five or six of them or maybe, maybe 10 of them. Okay. Maybe a bit more. And the same for Mike, when he comes up and fishes here, he know a few of them around here, but because I'm here all the time and, and that's what he said about the local knowledge, I know extra ones. And uh, another thing as well, that I find as well, Mike, uh, we've said this before, they don't always produce every year. So you have to check them. No. You, you go back to a place. That, Cause that's always going to ask you, like say if there's 30 duck holes, right? Mm. And you're saying five or six might only be producing. Do you have to like literally go out in the boat and you're going around <laughs> literally checking the 30 to cut? Or do you have an idea most years, this time of year, these five or what will be? No, not specifically. No, no. I, can't. I mean, you can go into like the thing with the duck fly is like it's it's that's why it's it, not alone is it the first kind of hatches of the year, but. As as well as that, it like it is, you know what I mean. It, it's it, you, know, it's very you know Pacific at times as well, you know what I mean. And you can go into some duck duck hole areas, and there's plenty of fly hatching, and mm -hmm. you won't get a pull of a trout. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can go into others where there's only a trickle of fly, and the next thing you can get two or three fish in there. Do you know what I mean? So it's it doesn't. It's you really have to be out, and you really have to be trying places and knowing them. And you know, as I said to you, like if if you're kind of confident enough of what you're doing, it, you eliminate those areas fairly fast because you know what you're fishing is right. You know, the way you're fishing is right. And if you're not getting pulls, you're not getting takes, well, just fish aren't active there. Do you know what I mean? And, and that can be the case, you know? So you wouldn't stick around long. You'd, you'd head off quick. No, you wouldn't be sticking around long. No, you'd be, you know, if you know what you're doing is right, you'd be yeah. moving until you find See if you do stick where, where place, fish are active, you know. Yeah, because if you stick in a place and there's nothing happening, you you you're potentially wasting time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I that's your, what I find. Cut your losses you know, so. and check another place. Yeah, and you will get like as I said to you, even if it's a day you're out, and if you do narrow it down to a few places where you know fish are active, like is you know the the main trick as well is like don't hammer them. Because they're small areas, they're 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 you know, and they're not big areas. And you know, if you take a fish or two out of there, like you're going to cause a bit of disturbance, commotion. You can't. You're only going to get a certain amount of short drifts over those areas. They do. They you turn know, off. So you, yeah, you're going to put fish off. So you know, if you move to somewhere else and maybe an hour later come back there again, you'll probably have a good chance of getting another fish in it. You know, but if you if you sit in them and hammer them, you will put them off. Like so. You know what I mean? The fish are, you know what, we often see it there, like especially at the very, very start of the duck fly, you know, it'll be flat cam in a place and you'll see fish moving. You could see five or six fish moving, right? And it just a pin ripple comes across it. They're gone. gone. Yeah. Just it just and like it's amazing. Do you know what I mean? They, they just it, it'll just it'll just put them off, you know. It must be hard though, is it? And it's getting that balance right between your catching fish and then you have to reel in. <laughs> 
<laughs> and leave them like well, you, know? you kind of know yourself you kind of get to know it after a while that if you kind of know that if you rest that and leave it it's worth it like you're going to get more fish there again do you know what i mean whereas if you sit in it and hammer it well you're just going to spook them off like you know what i mean so you know it's shallow most of the areas like are shallow you know what i mean they're not very deep so you know and like you will spook fish very easily there like you know yeah you're talking generally about six to eight feet mark aren't you yeah, six to eight feet, probably average, yeah. Yeah, you know? and a small area, so it's very easy. It's very easy to disturb them. Yeah, very easy to disturb them, yeah. And, you know, and as I said to you, sometimes, like, you might be only, especially in the early part of the duck fly, you, you could be only talking about corners mm. of a place, just a corner off an, off an island, and, like, there's fly hatching there, and those, and you see and fish are moving on them. But, like, if you go out, like, if, if there's a little breeze blown off that, like, those pupa are maybe drifting out. Fish might be active on them for about 10 yards or so. But after that, like if you're out into more open water, they just they just won't, you know what I mean? That the pupa isn't there and they're not going to be, they're not going to be feeding on them, you know. That's where people sometimes make a mistake, is this they, they catch a fish and they drift down out and they drift out and they drift out. And it could be still in pretty okay water, and that maybe a week later will be fishing, but mm. at that time it's not, you know what I mean? And that's the thing I was asking. Like, if it starts kind of March, when does the duck fly end? You're going to get about two weeks. You're looking at probably oh, short. Start, mm. Yeah, probably about two weeks. You're going to get about two weeks to two and a half weeks, depending on the weather again. Do you know what I mean? It's very, very, very weather dependent. You very rarely have duck fly fishing uh, after the 4th or 5th of April. Wow. No, so it's really the, it, it signals the real start of the fishing so to speak like even though it's, it does yeah it was the first real kind of hatch of, yeah. of fly yeah. you know what I mean and, well, you like, know. You're, you're fishing to, sometimes you're fishing once fish start moving and we're all the same everybody's the same you know that as well the same with you in the river Dara you see fish move and just gets you going yeah yeah and, yeah you know and that's what the duck fly does yeah, yeah it gets fish moving and that gets us going yeah you it's, know? it's like you feel like the yeah. water's come to life again Mm, yeah. yeah yeah see normally normally like this time of the year like well last year being an exception normally like with like okay take this winter for instance is that like we've you know we've had good high water there at times no oh, mad floods or anything but it's been good and high um you know we've had a good bit of cold cold weather and that you know so you'd be hopeful that fish will be hungry fish fish will be active you know what i mean that they're like they've you know the water should have cooled down a fair bit so they're you know they will have the year last year was an exception from the point of view that we had low water all winter and it was mm-hmm. extremely mild i mean i had one morning last year last winter previous to this one where actually there was a bit of frost on my car in the morning time where actually you'd be saying better watch the road going up you know what i mean one one morning of the whole winter like the, the lake never rose all winter long we went out 15th of february last year and it was a summer level as a result though mike and tom when the, the when it's mild like that does the duck fly hatch earlier then or is the temperature generally only in sometimes summer? sometimes it does it's it it's very very hard to put a handle on to be honest with you it probably won't slow it down unless you had a load of snow this year and you had a lot of cold water coming down from the mountains into the lake to really cool it down i think that would slow things down maybe for a week or so but other than that i don't think it puts it off you know what i mean you're you're looking sometime between probably for it to really kick off any probably time between the 17th and the 22nd yeah it's that actually kind of, it's interesting now and we've talked about different parts of the lake we're probably a couple of days earlier up here, Mike. Be a little bit earlier up your way. Yeah, yeah a little gas. bit earlier up yeah. your way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a rule, it would be. Yeah, you get a few days like normal in Doris. You'd get probably Paddy's Day. We've seen a lot of the time. We've had duck flying Paddy's mm. Day. Yeah. Um, whereas down the lake, then it gets probably. If I was, if I was to be honest, I would be saying probably the twentieth, twenty second, mm. that kind of time. Yeah. Uh, more so, you know. As it goes on, because you there are places that it does hatch that bit later. There is, yeah. And even here in Doors, there's a couple of places I would know that as the duck flies goes on, and I'm going into April, there's a couple of places I'll try because over the years I know it's it's slightly deeper here, and and it might be just that, but they're always a couple of days, maybe even a week later. Then. 
So yeah, local I think maybe slightly part, if you have slightly deeper water, I think it does it just mm. slows it maybe a little bit as well, you know. And what's the kind of average size of fish you'd be catching? Depends on the part of the lake you're in, to be honest with you, you know. I mean, where I am, probably two pound yeah. is probably an average fish. Yeah. For you to be probably straight about it, probably about two pounds is probably an average fish, you know. But it's up with me, then you'd probably be looking. Well, duck fly, it can vary, but you could have it up as a pound three quarters sometimes. It's generally generally a pound and a half. It's a good stamp of fish up here. Not as not as big as far as the lake that Mike is talking about there, but still still decent enough. Yeah. And then, yeah. then there are certain areas up here that have fish equally as good as where Mike is. Well, I, I yeah. can't say that on it. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's an average. If you if you want to, I suppose an overall average two yeah. pound two and a quarter. You know what I mean? Is a kind of an average. But like I suppose you would get a, you know, a bigger standard of fish as in general. You know, mm. but as Tom says, there is areas and bays then where, you know, just why don't for whatever reason you know what I mean? You would get slightly bigger fish, but you know parts of the lake, but not always. Like you know, so mm. you know there is some places you would expect a better quality fish, but. It's not always the case, you know. How many on the cast? I normally fish about a 20 foot cast and uh and four buzzers. Well, eight foot four four four. Yeah, probably about that. Yeah. yeah, probably about four foot space between the flies. If you go any more than that, you're gonna struggle. You're gonna struggle with landing a fish on your tail fly, really, you know. Mm. I have a float line all the time for me, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always fish a float line, floor carpet leader. They're the, like a lot of the areas you're fishing are quite shallow. You know, they're not deep areas, you know what I mean? So, like, you'd often be, if you, like, if you fish moving in front of you, like, you'd normally be just casting, you know what I mean? And, you know, your flies wouldn't have dropped six inches, eight inches, like, by the time, you know what I mean, you'd get a take of a fish, you know? Because fish are moving high in the water, you know? The other the other thing to think about that is that, like, in the even time, as Tom will tell you there, you, like, once the time changes, really, I, I do find, you know, once the time changes early in the marches, you get a bit of a stretch, like you have some brilliant dry fly fishing, mm, absolutely yeah. brilliant yeah. dry fly fishing, especially later in the duck fly because you've got more adults. There's more adults, you know, egg laying females goes out and even time onto the water, you know, and uh, that really brings on a. If you get a nice bammy mar in the March evening, you know, where it just it's nice and calm and it's it's mild, you can have some exceptional dry fly fishing. Mm. In, the, in those conditions, yeah, we've had some cracking fishing, Mike. We've oh, brilliant fishing! Yeah, yeah, some fishing brilliant fishing, like and just really small, like size 16, 18 dries, like you know. And it must be a lovely time because it's not as busy. It's not as busy, yeah, yeah. You can, well, in fairness, now, like a lot of lads now will might be after like, this a episode. Lot more then. Guys got to know the car, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot more guys kind of like are you know fishing it, like you know, so like duck fly, it does it does kind of signal the start of the fly fishing really you know mm. is that yeah like what, a lot of it, well. it, it'd never like it'd never be as busy as mayfly there but there'll be a fair few boats out yeah Popular, oh, yeah, you know? Would, yeah yeah you know be a good few out. but like the nice thing about the even is that like when you're beside the lake it's brilliant because mm. you can come home from work and you can say oh tonight's even this evening actually i'll i go for i go to from seven o'clock till half, yeah, it'll probably be dark around half eight or something on the time change so it's it's really, half, it's, yeah, so. You need the time to change because it does give you yeah. that extra time to get out. Leave. Yeah, you need the time to change. Yeah, that's normally Which I wouldn't. Always I the last, the last, then, you know. Yeah, the last Saturday in March. So depending on when that is, but you'll always get time. And it, once you get an evening, that and as Mike said, they're a bit bammy. You know, just that it doesn't go cold, and if the wind drops, just pull yourself into any place where you'll see egg layers that the um, the adults. Actually, when you get really big hatches, there it's. A great sight. It's like um, plumes of smoke above the island. Oh my God. Mm. Yeah, there's so many plumes of smoke. They're just in columns, right? Once you see that on an island, just pull into the lee and just wait. No way. Just wait yeah. to see it. So, like, for that time of the year, what you'd be talking, like, we we if we were doing a day, Mike, we'd fish straight line buzzers during the day. And then yeah. once the evening comes on, you'd have the dry fly rod set up, five weight rod set up, and just sit and wait and that's it. So basically, and we didn't mention that, but we use fluorocarbon. We both use fluorocarbon, Mike and myself, for, for the buzzers. And that sinks that bit quicker. 
so it gets your flies down. And your flies think, just drop down slowly, like through the through the water column, you know. And the four flies, Mike, they they sing. They're all at different levels then. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you're they, getting yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So you can kind of like at a forty-five degree angle there, if you if you kind of imagine it. So like, say that your your tail buzzer has reached the bottom of the lake or near enough the bottom of the lake, so it's coming up in kind of increments. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So you're pretty much like as I, as we said there, if you're fishing eight foot of water. You know your four, you know what I mean. So your your flies are kind of spaced up along. So yeah, you, know, you often at, hit at the an bottom. angle at about yeah. a forty five degree angle. So you're pretty much covering yeah. you know a lot of different depths as well. You know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Your point fly sometimes, Mike, in eight to ten foot of water, if it's not too windy, your point fly will actually drag the bottom. You'll feel yeah. it. Yeah. But the the other flies are are fishing above that. That's right. Yeah. Mm. And do you generally find then if you're there's a certain depth that you they latch onto that you're catching them at, like say it's the top drop or whatever. Like yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. If you, like if you're getting a lot of fish again, like if you're getting a lot of fish up high in your on your top fly or your second fly, you know, sometimes not a bad idea is to put a floating pattern onto your on your point fly. So you actually fish kind of washing line style. Then mm. you know what I mean that you're kind of keeping all your yeah. all your flies relatively high, you know, in the water, you know. And in terms of the buzzers um, that you're using, like, is it just different colors? Like in terms of what do you what do you basically? To be honest with you, for duck fly, black and silver is predominantly. Mm. You know, you have different yeah. cheese colors, oranges, reds, and stuff like that. You know what I mean? But you don't have to be. It's not. It's, the pattern isn't mad specific, to be honest with you. I, I think eerie is, is is more important than that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, than yeah. than the actual patterns of the flies. Like, like there's a lot of good buzzer patterns out there now. Like it's not like it was years ago where a handful of people knew about this. Like everybody <laughs> is barely, you know, there's a lot of guys out there now and a lot of guys catching fish on buzzers and fair play and you know, it's, I think it's developed over the years in fairness, you know what I mean? There's a lot of good guys out there fishing buzzers now. I don't think it's, you know, probably if you had asked everybody to put their patterns on the table, there probably wouldn't be a huge amount of difference in the whole lot of any of them, to be honest with you, you know what I mean? So, but really you're, you're talking about like, kind of like, you know, I suppose silvers and blacks really for bodies and stuff like that. And you know what I mean? With kind of like orange, red cheeks. Like if you look at the duck fly when it's hatching, out of the water like you get this kind of like as, as it's coming out of the water you know attach it, it you get this real vibrant orange mm. you know as the blood comes into the into the body of it you know what i mean and it's so really like, prominent to see why isn't it even like oh yeah yeah if you see them actually hatching it's amazing this it's not like little sticks and then yeah as you see them hatch out of the water you get this big bust of orange you know and i suppose that's you know so you know if you look at a buzzer like uh from a duck fly buzzer like a you know pupa stage like you know what i mean it's normally got kind of anything from you know a strong yellow to a, an orange cheek color you know how long has buzzer fishing been going on in carb and where's the influence for it well the influence would have come from the english yeah. reservoirs really to be honest um how long it's going on for one thing not really i mean i i remember winning competitions on buzzers and probably early 2000 on carob so you know and i wouldn't be the first one that was doing it so you know like i uh, guiding back then around 2098 on i suppose that kind of time um we'd have been guiding a lot of guys from the uk and like i guys to come out and you know were fishing buzzer patterns like prior to that like you'd be fishing small wets small wet patterns and emergers and stuff like that you know but um that's really kind of where it kind of came from, you know, and then you would have had a certain amount of anglers, I suppose, fishing internationals going away, you know, coming back with different patterns and different techniques, you know, that was working on the reservoirs and implementing them here and trying them here. So that's where it kind of would have developed from, you know? Yeah. Cause the reason why I wanted to ask you was kind of when it was introduced was like, you know, Tom, like, like go back to the nineties or the eighties, was it lads were fishing wet, but I suppose was the catches as good then? Were they as good? Yeah, uh, yeah, they probably were, but only when you were only fishing wet, you needed conditions perfect all the time. So you don't remember the days you went out that uh, it was a bit too windy for your wets to work, or a bit too the opposite actually. But there was no wind. I mean, the beauty of buzzers is you can fish your five, 
present your flies perfect when it's flat cap because they're an under, right? So um so were the lads targeting the duck fly back then as well? Yeah. But just well, like, with flies that weren't as uh the only thing is I look back, you probably look at your wet fly pa- or duck fly. Uh, let me say this, it's a bit of a duck fly wets back then, Mike. Mm-hmm. They were very sparse. Okay. Now, let's yeah. be honest, they were really sparse. Like I used to fish a blay and black that were hardly anything in it. The slip of a wing, hardly no body, little rib, and a, a two strands of a tail. But the other thing was, Mike, we, we the, the retrieve was dead slow. Yeah. The retrieve was almost like a buzzer retrieve. But you did not fish them, you didn't fish them fast at all. That's right. So, you know, I mean, were those flies being taken high in the water as pupa patterns probably were, yeah. you yeah. know? So, but just as man says, it's got more advanced, you know what I mean? And I suppose the thing about the buzzer, because you're in, you're closely representing the natural instinct, insect is that you are getting more fish, probably better quality fish, larger fish, you know? Mm, yeah. You know, the competitions have changed here then over the years as well. Like back in the day, at one stage, you're on a 12 inch size limit, you know what I mean? Now you're on a 13 inch limit, you're four fish bag. So, you know, in a lot of competitions, I mean, you can you can come in with four four pound fish, or you can come in with four three pound fish. Do you know what I mean? It's a big difference weight wise. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, that has pushed on as well advancements as well. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously, you know, you have to target with a, with a four fish bag limit. You know, you're targeting better quality fish. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if you can even measure. It. Like, was there skepticism at the time when you know? These lads are coming in with their fancy buzzers, like you know. Probably still is to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, Mike? No, I'm trying to. I'm trying to peel back the layers no here again. of what it's really about. <laughs> I suppose, like anything, there's there'll always be resistance to anything new from certain quarters. I put that as yeah. eloquently as I can. <laughs> Yeah, you're always, look, I suppose if you look over fly fishing history, there's always been changed. You know what I mean? Like, if so, I mean, I think that's all part of it at the end of the day. You know, I mean, just to go off field a bit like we, we've had this chat recently, Tom and myself, and says, like, there's an awful lot more, like, late in the season last year, um, whereas the fishing wasn't great, but, like, I fished a lot of lure patterns now. Yeah. I had huge follows and interest to fish. I didn't. I caught a few fish. Didn't catch anything spectacular, but the amount of interest I had would have me trying it again this year. Mm-hmm. And is Very that just is that just the way the lake is developing? And I mean, I seen last summer in the lake during the summer. I remember pulling into one island one day around July, maybe early August time, and literally the whole shoreline was full of roach fry. Like, literally, there was thousands of them. Mm. I mean, we'll say up to about five centimetres. Um, so, like, are fish feeding on them more so now? Well, personally, I think they are. You know, I mean, as I said, it's very hard to go by last year because it was a, it was a very strange year from start to finish. Um, but the amount of interest from fish was, would you would take note of it. So, like, there's always developments. There's always something. There's always somebody trying something. There's always, and that's the way it should be, to be honest with you. Like, that's that's how things develop, you know? Yeah, it's very interesting, Mike, because, I, sorry, Dar, but I was with you one of those days that were at the follows, and we both came away thinking, we're nearly there. we got to tweak something, mm. you know? Yeah, yeah. But- nearly there. We're getting we're getting the interest, but we're not converting them into, into solid hits, solid takes, or, or, or yeah, fish. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But you know, maybe that was just, you know, last year, as I said to you, was one of those kind of head scratchers anyway, to be honest with you. It just, yeah. you know, it just didn't really happen anywhere in any lake. So, you know. No, I was going to say, like, it's, it's interesting, though, that you were talking about the skepticism around the buzzer. I can understand when it was first introduced, but I, 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 I kind of got the impression nowadays that it's just accepted now for duck fly that time of year. Like, is it? Yeah, it's probably an advancement, like, like everything else. You know what I mean? People, I mean... You know things change that's the way it, that's the way the world is like i mean a lot more people fishing dries now than there was 
do you know what I mean? Even 10 years ago, do you know what I mean? So like, there's a lot more, I think, I think the angler now, and even in general, I think he's better informed. I think he wants, you know, and there's a lot more information out there if he wants to get it, do you know what I mean? Um, like don't, you know, so I, I think like the guys that are fishing now, I think the vast majority of guys fishing now are interested. Um, they're interested in the lakes, they're interested in, you know, you know, they're interested in the care of the lakes, they're interested in, you know, they're interested in their patterns, they're interested in catching, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody wants to be going out every day and not catching like it. So, you know. I suppose, Mike, you, you've kind of been forced, haven't you, because it's the numbers aren't there or whatever, or they're getting harder to catch or they're getting smarter, whatever it is. You, The anglers have had to up their game as a result. Yeah, I think it's just like everything else. I think there's change. There's change in the lakes as well. I think there's plenty of fish in the lakes. Uh, if, I, if I'm perfectly honest with you, there's, I don't think there's any shortage of trout. Uh, but I think the, I think fish are, you know, they're changing their habits slightly as well. Mm, yeah. So, you know, I mean, you know, and look, you have to look at it as the end of that, you have invasive species, whatever you want to call them there in, 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 you know, you have a lot more perch, you have a lot more roach, you know, as well. Um, so like when you see in the middle of the summer, like pulling in the shore of an Island over 5,000 fry shooting off. Well, you know, that has to have an effect. That's just one Island and one shoreline. Like that's not just there. That's, every island it's, yeah, it's, it's telling you something like isn't it use your eyes it's and ears like. something so that's why i kind of like started trying these like last year i said thomas is like definitely like this is you know yeah. for a bit you know and like the amount of like like fish were in a you know you had a lot of follows you had a lot of interest to fish you know what i mean so you know that tells you the fish are you know when i'm fish you've caught as well by spooning them like they have fry in them do you know what I mean so predominantly I think later in the season now I think I think like a few years ago there was more sedge you know there was more insect life you know but I think the last few years definitely like there's been an awful lot more fry in the lakes you know what I mean then and fish aren't as you know you're not getting fish up top of the water as regular as you would before I won't say they're not but not as regular as they were before you know actually so it I, makes it go on, Tom, sorry. yeah it just follows on the point there like so if you're out in July and there's a load of fry, not a lot of sedges, you know, why should you be persisting with the team of Welshmen but pulling it through the top? When if you put on some lures and fish just in under, you know. What's the phrase from Einstein, isn't it? The definition of bandits is doing the same thing and expecting different results, isn't it? Results, yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. so like that's just maybe not, maybe the case, but, you know, will you see in a few years' time that, you know what I mean, you're getting better results on fry patterns mm. late in the year than you traditionally would have had top of the water on sedge patterns and stuff like that. We're seeing that with fry patterns at the moment. And like, to be honest, you buzzer fishing 20 years ago is a response to the fact that it's probably an increase in the amount of buzzer in the lake. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, myself and Mike have had this discussion before that we may, we do wonder whether there's an actual decrease in the amount of buzzer in the lake at the moment since the advent of the zebra mussel. Like, for example, the Camto buzzer, which is the next buzzer, which (laughs) we haven't got around to, um, like that hatch could normally, Mike and I remember it last in three, four weeks, even longer, probably even longer. Doesn't has there's no length now. The numbers are really down, it's still there, and you still get good fishing. Mm. But uh, I think it always was like traditionally, it always was like that buzzer was always there in the summer. Mm. But you know, I think the it was there, but maybe prolifically for maybe a couple of weeks, and then over time, with you know enrichment water quality whatever you know i i think then it went prolific for a while but i think now it's with the zebra whether it's the zebra muster or whatever is definitely the water clarity has improved in the lake mm. um whether that's masking something else or not who knows but definitely like the summer buzzer hatches are not as prolific as they were do you know what i mean but say 18 years ago what about the duck fly hatches duck fly is a different type of buzzer you see it, it's more I suppose the duck fly was always there. It's 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 kind of like an it's kind of like the olives. It's kind of like the mayfly. You know what I mean? It hatches at the start of the year. It, yeah. You know, it's it, it was all it was always kind of there in those numbers. You know, I think it was the summer buzzer really that wasn't there yeah. for as long and in those numbers. I think that that exploded for a number of years, but it, it seems to be kind of declined a bit the last few years. You know, isn't that fascinating in itself though? How some flies, some hatches are 
mm. remain strong and yet others are, you know. Yeah, well, I suppose some of them are going back to the way they were, not so maybe they were strong for the wrong reason. Because yeah. Yeah. Poor water quality, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. very true, actually. Yeah, it's it, it's yeah. it's fa- and, and what I find fascinating about it as well is it's it's not like you can say, right, here's one, you know, hatch, here's what it is, it's gonna be the same. <laughs> every yeah. every example is different, and every time of year is different, every context is mm-hmm. different, and there's so many yes. moving parts to it, isn't it? Like sure, it was the same all the time, you know, crack here. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's why they call it fishing and not catching. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we'd have a lot to talk about. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, we'd point. find something. Oh, we'd find something there. Without a doubt. Uh, right, Mike, before we go, the last time you were on with us, we hadn't, start, we hadn't started our regular feature. And now that you're back with us, we're going to it's have actually the more, reason we got you on, Mike. We didn't really want to talk about the stuck fly. No, we just, didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew there was a catch. <laughs> oh, was a catch. Speaking of catches. So, Mike. I want to ask you, what is your most memorable fish on the fly? Oh, Jesus. I'd have to. That is hard to quantify, to be perfectly honest. But I will say the year I won the World Cup on mask, it was, to put it just a quick story, was the morning we went out, I knew exactly where the World Cup was going to be won. I didn't know who's going to win it, obviously, but I knew exactly where it was going to be won. And I said to my boat partner around the day, I says, look, where I wanted to go. He was in agreement. I says, just one thing. I says, we're staying there for the day. I says, we're not leaving it for the day. And he says, fair enough. That's grand. So we went over across the lake anyway, and I had a fish at quarter past 12. And my boat partner had a fish at half 12. And I didn't meet another fish that day till three o'clock. And uh, between three o'clock and half five, I boarded another nine fish and four of them measured. And my last fish, because it was a four fish kill that time and you're, you're on catch and release after that. I knew it was going quite well. The Bush Telegraph was <laughs> around and most of those, my boatman was getting a few phone calls saying, How's he going now? When how's he getting on? And there's nobody catching and all the rest of it. I knew I was going fairly well. And about 20 past five, I had my fifth fish. And he was a lovely fish. He was about 42 centimeters because we were measured at the time. I'd say he was two pound plus. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm not going to be far away today. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that is probably one of my most memorable fish anyway. Yeah. So he probably just does stand in my mind, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that was so, something else. I remember that day well, Mike. Fair play to you. Yep. Yeah, I said, I says, I think, I says, I'll be, I says, I'll be hard bet now. So, and you turned out it wasn't. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it that led you to that spot? Probably the heat days. I'd been out all week, and um, most of the heat winners were coming from that area. It was over around the over around the college, over around Carrigan Minlock area. And um, the one thing I did notice every day was that. I found anyway on my boat and other boats from talking to lads was that the majority of the fish were being caught in the afternoon. And yeah, that's why that. yeah. I, I kind of said, right, look, there's bags of fish coming from here every day. Someone is definitely gonna is gonna click here. I said, and but the only thing I, I was that's why I really wanted to get agreement that we were sticking it out for the day, because you know, in fairness to the other person as well, if you're there for a few hours and you're catching nothing, just you know. They are quite easy, to yeah. Say, yeah. You know, I think we should try somewhere else, you know. So, my main thing that day was it was funny. It's just sometimes that when you're on the lake, sometimes you just know the areas, you just know where's fishing, you just know where to go, you know. Um, last year now in the World Cup, I was boating in the final, and uh, the lad that was with me, I actually knew the area. We'd been there a couple of days earlier, there was fish there. And I said, Look, I can bring you somewhere. I think, I think you'll you'll get fish there. Do you know what I mean? I think if we stick it out, it's hard fishing, but I think if you stick it out, we'll get fish there. Fairness to me, fished hard all day. It was it was tough conditions, you know what I mean? And he ended up second. So yeah. um a little bit of lucky. Backed a couple of fish as well. If another one of them, even a even a measuring fish had measure, you know, even a measuring fish like one of those undersized was a measuring fish, he'd have won it. So you know it's just sometimes especially in the deeps and the mask 
it's there's areas that are fishing you know so i i just knew that area was fishing and but the big thing funny thing and that i had remarked on on the previous days was definitely i for me the afternoons were fishing better than the mornings there so that's once i had the agreement we're staying there for the day i said yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean i was happy enough you know you love it when a plan comes together yeah yeah and it's sometimes certainly you have good. to go to plan b or c but that's, that's good <laughs> plan a works as good uh, well done mike thanks a million for joining us again um fascinating finding out about the duck fly and um i'm sure um, people will be keen and eager now obviously the season is starting next week on the 15th yeah and, can't, uh, wait. can't wait he isn't really looking forward to getting out <laughs> it's the real christmas for you <laughs> coming around that's it you, know? you can have christmas <laughs> <laughs> mike thanks a million for joining us thanks okay tight lines lads our thanks to mike Heady for joining us on the show and don't forget to rate review and follow the island on the fly podcast on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcast from Plus, you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.